Good afternoon and welcome today's web to today's webinar, Improving Productivity in the M&A Process. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Uh, next slide, Keith. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent out after the event. All attendees are muted and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions, use the Q&A button on your screen. We'll answer questions at the end. If there are questions that we are not able to get to, we'll answer those via email after the webinar. I'd like to introduce our two presenters, Keith Parent, CEO and co-founder of Court Square Group, and Catherine Lenardi, CEO of Genese. Uh, Keith, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Roy. Uh, glad to be here, folks. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for this hour today. Hopefully we won't go to full hour and just give you some time back. But uh, um, Catherine and I have been together for a, a, a number of years now working together and it's a pleasure to be on a, a webinar with Catherine. Uh, my name is Keith Perrin. I am the CEO in, of Court Square Group. We are a managed service firm. We manage IT infrastructure for life science companies, um, pharmaceutical, biotech, med device. We also have um, a number of different companies that we work with. RegDocs 365 is one that's a content repository that I'll talk about a little bit later, as well as uh, another company, it's an EDC and EPRO company in Pyramid. But uh, enough about that. Catherine, how about some background on you? Hi, thank you, Keith. Thank you so much um, for this, uh, to, to join us today. Um, my name is Catherine Lenardi. I'm the CEO founder of Genese. At Genese, we offer um, a platform that supports normalization and standardization of data, as well as providing with um, advanced analytics empowered by artificial intelligence. We're located in Montreal, and we have a dedicated team of uh, AI, a PhD data scientists who will go through the uh, different issues or problems problems or challenges that customers face when wanting to make their data talk and come up with uh, relevant pieces of AI, such as the one we're going to be uh, discussing today, namely Ref AI. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about um, the whole concept of M&A and how we're using our system to be able to deal with that. Um, Court Square has a, com a system called RegDocs 365 that we host and manage and, and work with a lot of our clients on. One of the, our clients came up with a, a problem that they had. They bought a compound from a very large pharmaceutical company and they had migrated it over and they used a, a non-validated, non-qualified method of moving it. They moved it into whether it was box or Dropbox, whatever it was. And they realized after a while when people started looking for files and pulling things out and creating new folders in that area that they probably shouldn't have done it that way. So they said, hey, can you guys help us to retransfer this doc, this set of documents and bring these in? So we did. We have a qualified and validated method for bringing those documents in. So um, we migrated those files over. They were able to get all the audit trails, all the checksums on the documents and everything that they normally would get, that we would normally get as we do some of that uh, transferring of documents. One of the big things that we um, did with this client is after we copied all the documents over and they had everything set the way they wanted it to set, they kept asking us to get more files back from um, the company they had acquired this comp board come for. And I started to talk with them about it and said, what's happening? What's really going on? Because we seem to have, uh, you know, did we, do, did we screw something up? Did we not get all the files? What happened? And what they said is, you know, we've got all these files, we had due diligence, we went through, we thought we had everything. But what happens is until you start reading through these documents and you identify documents that they're referring to, um, you don't know you don't have them. And part of the issue is um, they had to go back to the large pharma company and ask for these documents. Well, if you wait three months or six months down the road and you go back and you ask a big pharma company to find something, guess what? All those people are working on other projects by then. The data has been probably re-archived or put back in. Now, when you ask for that information, what happens is those it costs weeks or months just to get the data out. And it's it's really um, a pain for you as a, as a company buying a compound. And it happens everywhere. I'm on an, uh, an IRIS M&A team and um, working group. And we talk about this on a regular basis. This is a universal problem. Everybody gets these documents. 
but then you don't realize what, what you don't have until it's somewhere down the road. So how are we gonna do that? How do we fix that problem? What do we do? Well, the solution was something that we came up with. I was at a conference and I met Catherine and Catherine and I started talking about um, what they do. And we decided to come up with a tool and we called that tool Ref AI. And um, it was a great thing. I, I was able to explain the information, explain what the problem was to Catherine, to her team. And what we wanted to do was do something very simple. We wanted to identify all of the existing documents that were purchased. We would typically do that anyway as part of our transfer and make sure that we get all the documents that are there. So that was an easy thing to do. But then it was her team and their ability to use artificial intelligence and machine learning. We wanted to use that NLP to read through all the documents and machine learning to identify all the references within uh, two external documents. And then we wanted to look at our existing documents to determine if the documents existed or if it was missing. So that was the genesis of kind of the conversation that we first started with and said, let's identify these missing documents during the due diligence phase rather than months later, saving time and money for our clients. Additionally, in talking to Catherine, they've got other tools within their AI um, suite of tools that they have that can also help to do things with documents, potentially even auto classifying some of those documents for further areas. And we'll talk about that a little bit further as we get in. So, Catherine, tell us a little bit more about, you know, how we work together and, and what you saw as, as a great opportunity here. So it was great to meet Keith first because Keith has a deep understanding of the customer's assets. So um, he was able to walk us through the different types of documents, the different challenges, as he maintains a really close relationship with his uh, partners and customers. He's really well aware of the challenges that they face on their day-to-day -day operation. And mergers and acquisition was a fabulous use case for to um, to uh, address. Um, with the help of Keith, we were able to actually identify the requirements. So um, there are many ideas for the applications of AI, but this one was uh, really relevant to the team because it was a real case with a real challenge where we had real production data that we could uh, work on with Keith and um, the customers so that we could actually test the solution in a real environment and how and doing so and doing it iteratively with Keith with his feedback with the feedback from the customer we were able to go from um, an accuracy of 60% um, to an accuracy of 95%. So it's this partnership that made the best out of the an advanced technology that we used combined with the assets, the information, the data, having uh, this close relationship between us where we were able to discuss the outcomes and discuss as well what were the acceptance criteria for this solution to be complete and produce the utmost value for uh, people facing challenges with their mergers and acquisition um, uh, reference check-in. You know, it's interesting. I've been in this industry. Courtsquare has been around for almost 30 years. And we've hosted lots of different applications. I, I'm a firm believer that um, we can buy before we build. So instead of going out there and trying to build something that's there, you look around to see if there's other tools that can do this work. We didn't see the tools, but the next best thing is to find somebody who actually understands the technology you may not understand. And in this case, finding Catherine and talking about some of the projects they had done, it was important for us to be able to say, hey, here's a problem we have. Do you think we could solve this? Or do you have a team that could solve this? In talking with her engineers, it became evident that, yeah, these are, this was the right team to work with. We created um, this Ref AI tool, Ref AI and RegDocs. We needed the, the two things to work together. One is RegDocs is a, a repository. It's a way where we can actually transfer and do in a qualified and a validated manner, transferring those files because we're dealing with regulatory data, things that were going to be filed with the FDA. You got to be able to show control over those documents. But at the same time, we wanted to have a tool that was non-invasive that could actually go through and read all these tools without pushing them all over the place, use our libraries and identify what we needed to do and send us back the information that we could then do that was actionable for us. In this mm -hmm. case, the output came in a number of different ways that we could do it. One was the listing of all the documents that were missing. That was a huge benefit just to be able to show these documents are missing. 
Um, we could then potentially, we actually talked about a couple of different ways of, of looking at auto classifying some of the things based on whether it's the file location or it's topic or content or metadata, we're still defining different areas to do that. And actually, I, I just had a com conversation the other day with somebody who is very specific around uh, a certain area of the regulatory um, information cycle. And he said, hey, if I could put these documents in this area, that would be perfect. So those are things that we continue to try to evolve as we go forward looking at documents. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to be able to say, hey, can I reformat those output libraries in RegDoc so that they actually match the target locations of the company that we're gonna be uh, putting it into the, the legacy systems. So those are things that we can actually do as part of that working documents or working library uh, classification and be able to do that for the clients. And at the same time, we can also generate PDF output or Excel reports if they're looking for these kind of things to be able to share with upper management or other areas to say, hey, we need this for our, for our work. Um, some of the other areas I think leverage other tools that um, Janae's has as well. And I'll let Catherine talk about those right now. Yes, absolutely. It's always interesting, Keith, as you mentioned, to once you get um, the data, the assets, the documents, to uh, identify different use cases or applications of AI to actually unleash the power of the, uh, the, the, the information that is hidden within the document. So using natural language processing, open information extraction, my team is able to actually normalize, standardize the data, come up with the right information, in the right format, so that multiple pieces of analytics, namely AI or smart functions, can actually be applied to the same data set to produce different valuable results. So in that case, so we mentioned Ref AI, which is the identifying, the identify identification, sorry, of problematic uh, reference, but we also can apply to the same data set, quality management, so um, exception detections, types of AI. So, for instance, if we had an API log type of document where the certificate of analysis would be missing, the AI would find it. Uh, if we had a deviation where the impact assessment was incomplete, we would also be able to flag it. So, once you have the, the, the assets, the documents within Reg docs, then the Genesis um, uh, machine learning algorithm is able to detect which assets could be combined with pieces of AI to produce a result. Another example that you mentioned is the grouping of documents. So that's another piece of AI that we have that could be applied to the same data sets that were the same data set that was um, actually normalized, standardized dynamically. Um, we make sure that the data could fit with the analytics uh, by combining um, different pieces of machine learning to dynamically uh, produce the results. Um, so we have right there with Ref AI, the classifier and quality management, at least three pieces of AI that could be valuable to make your uh, mergers and uh, acquisition data set talk. Great, thank you, Catherine. Now that we've gone through a little bit of what, what the end result was and what we needed to do with this, let's talk a little, let's take a little bit closer look at what the real problem is and what, what Catherine's team had to go through as they were going through all these documents. I'm going to do a, you know, a 10,000 foot view of this document. So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details that, that some of her architects would probably do, but let's just talk about the fact that when you're dealing with lots of documents, they have a large number of references to other documents with them. So you really have to figure out what are the documents that, that you have and what are the ones that it's referring to. And, you know, sometimes you'll get down and you'll look at different batch files, deviations, signed, Certificates of authorization. There's lots of different things that are out there. You got to figure out, is it the end result of something? Is it the starting point of something? How do we deal with that? I wanted to, to work for our clients to create something. What can be very simple? What can be something that's easy to use? So our concept was, let's come up with kind of a drag and drop solution. If I can say, give me a library or let me drag my documents or this amount of information into an area and let's just point our algorithms at it can we come up with something? So the concept was we had our, our document repository. We would copy those things. We'd verify that we got all the documents in and then we'd point the, uh, the algorithms from uh, Gen A's, the Ref AI algorithms at our libraries and say, okay, chug through these things and give us a result. Obviously when you're dealing with large volumes of documents and you're dealing with you know, reading through these documents, even if we were had uh, the system running right now, it would take far too long to go through. Um, we've, 
we're continuing to work on capacity and performance management across these. Um, we're getting to the point now where it does a significant volume of documents um, on a very regular basis. We're doing word counts in the thousands of words per minute that they're dealing with across all these documents. So it's, it's I think it's up to about 13 or 15,000 documents uh, per minute of, uh, or not documents, but words per minute within the documents. So it all depends on the total number of documents. It depends on what's in those documents. But what's interesting is once we get the results, we get alerted to the results that are out there and it'll generate some of the output that will then be put back into our library so we can actually see some of those. And at that point, what happens is we get a couple different things. One is we're gonna get a library analysis st statistic. It's gonna tell us how many documents that we chug through, how many are our orphan documents or single documents out there, how many documents had um, working reference in them, how many references were found, how many references were missing. These are all things that you're gonna wanna look at and see in the, uh, in the document and what's in that library uh, on purpose. And the goal there is to really look at um, what's, what you have and what you don't have. Catherine, anything more to add to that? No, I think that's correct. Um, everything is in one place, all the information to consume. <clears throat> Sorry for that. And we got um, our inspiration from social media so that the interface would be um, really um, easy to use. And we want to make it as much white box as possible. Mm -hmm. So really explaining the, the behind the scene and providing as much information for the user to consume the information easily. What we did then is we looked and we said, okay, in order for me to see what's going on, we need to put in context. So um, one of the nice parts is if you've got like a, a tree view, people like to see how things lay out and where things are, are, are tied together. So if we could see where a document is, how it sits in a certain library, how it's tied to other documents, we were able to highlight the documents that are missing, the references that are there, the references that are missing. Our goal in doing this process was to give the user of the system the ability to, to look through this and say, oh, I know about that document. I know what we can do with that. Or, hey, I thought we had all of those. Let's figure out what went on. Or they know somebody to talk to about those documents. So giving them this representation was much easier than just giving a, a full list of, here, you're missing these documents. Well, we want to say, in what context do we have these documents and why are they, why are they important to look at? Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things um, pretty quickly. One of the next slides that we have talks about the ability to ignore or include files. So one of the nice parts about this is you also have a way within the system that let's say there's a document that's out there that we want to ignore because we know that that's something that is meaningless or doesn't really have, um, doesn't matter that it may be missing out of this thing. We want to be able to ignore that because when we iterate through these documents, and I want to emphasize that point, part of this is to do it during a due diligence phase and when, when we identify those documents that are missing, we want to go back to the acquiring firm, the, the firm that we're acquiring the, the compound from and say, hey, we're missing these documents. Give it back to us so that we can chug through those again and iterate on those documents continuously until we get to a high enough confidence level that we feel we have all you know, the majority of the files that we need to do as part of that. So let's look. And so the ability to ignore or include certain files is going to be really important for us as we go forward. And it's great the, the work that Catherine's team really put into to tying these kind of things together. So one of the things that we want to do is, okay, let's take a, a little bit deeper dive. How do we validate all the references within a document? Well, as I'm a, a user and I'm reading through things, you would think, well, just go to the reference section and say, hey, it's referring to these documents, let's pull them out. So the first thing we want to do is identify the files of a given repository, so make that list. We want to look inside them for those references. We want to cross-reference the references with the files that are there. And then we return that list of missing references. Sound, sounds pretty easy. However, when you get into the nuts and bolts of it, there's a lot more to it. Let's talk about, um, in this case, there's different types of documents. We could have what we call floating documents. There are certain documents that may not have any reference to them or they may not be tied to other documents. So they're just floating around. We wanna be able to categorize those and keep those so we know where they go. Again, it gets back to where do they go within the system do we tie them back to a, a legacy system when we're going to migrate them in or whatever? And then we have the interrelated documentation. Are things that are referring back to other documents tied there? So we first have to identify the type of document that we're looking at. Does it even have references? Do we do things with that? That's an important point that generates other things from a machine learning perspective that we can then correlate on. 
after that or before that is part of that. One of the big things is we think a lot about structured versus non-structured data. And when I talk about structured data, when you get a form and it has headers and footers and has all the fields that are nightly, nicely drawn out and everything, that's structured data. It makes life a lot easier to figure out what you need to do when you're looking at documents. And typically there's gonna be some reference to thing or there could be a, a whole file name in there and things like that. The non-structured data is really where that natural language processing comes in, that issue of, of the artificial intelligence aspect of going through the document, reading it as if you were a human and identifying what is a reference. Well, let's look at that and let's see a little bit more about how we deal with references themselves. An example would be looking at the reference section of an SOP. Why wouldn't I use it? If I've got a section of a document that already says, here are the documents that I use for this, now we can look at that reference section and we just check off all those documents that are there and we say, okay, well, these, this is great. Now we know we need these kind of documents. Well, if you look at these documents, one of the things that you're gonna notice is it's probably not in the format for the name of the document. So there's gotta be some more intelligence that goes around and says, okay, are these uh, certain types of documents? You look at the bottom here, we've got SOPs, you've got different things that look like they could be, um, whether it's an FDA guidance docs, document, an ICH uh, document that's out there, how do we know which, what's there and how we're gonna use that? Part of going through those is determining, is it an internal reference? Are we looking at some kind of manual that we created or a notebook? Or are we looking at some kind of report that was generated? Or is it an external reference to something that's industry standard? That's where the machine learning is gonna come in. It's gonna help out to figure out all the different pieces that, that it would need to, to go through and, and identify those. So that's part of the, the, the workflow that's happening while these documents are going through the process. <clears throat> Another ca capability that we've talked about is now we're actually looking at the names of the files themselves. And we say, well, how does that name of that file, I tie back to um, a reference to that file. So we identify the files in the given repository and keep the ones that refer to an asset. So look at the, the left side uh, of this and we're gonna see the file names themselves, but then look at the right side of the screen and you're gonna actually see where these are bits of information that make sense. We wanna be able to look at a protocol number. Can we use that as part of identifying information? We look at the title of the document. Can we use that to identify what's in there? Are there headers, are there footers that are representative that can be used? All the machine learning al algorithms will actually tie these things together. Um, and be used for generating what they need. Then you wanna look inside of those selected files for references representing an asset. What does that mean? Well, let's look at this simple paragraph that we've got here. You've got a reference in text annotator that will actually go through and say, hey, we recognized in this sentence, the method has been transferred according to the transfer protocol, blah, with this big number here. So now that has to equate to something. It's a reference to somewhere, you would naturally think that, hey, I'm gonna have a transfer protocol that ties back to this number. So now we wouldn't have to take that number and say, do we have that somewhere? And we have to now take that and say, what would that really be represented in a file itself? So think about the logic that you would do as a human to identify that file and say, okay, I'm looking for a certain type of file that would fit this um, methodology for that document. So the, the next step is to cross-reference those references. Everything's a reference. So we're gonna cross-reference the references we looked at with the selected files. So we're gonna actually look at the file name annotator, the ID annotator, and the title annotator, and kind of look at all of them separately and in, in conjunction and figure out, do I have the files themselves that make up those um, output files that are there? And the references inside the selected documents do they pertain to a different document or are they captured somewhere else that we've already had? It's that cross-reference capability that's really important trying to figure out how can I tie these things together? How do I pull them into one area? How can I make them um, have meaning to us as a, um, a machine learning tool going through? And don't forget, it's gonna get better. The larger the data sets that we're looking at, 
the more that machine learning kicks in and identifies an easier way to figure out how to do that across the board. Uh, one of the next things that we look at, Catherine's team was, was intrigued by the fact that we actually came up with um, even more references than we thought they did. When you think about doing this, you start out with a small data set. And in that small data set, you actually have the concept of um, sample data. And you say, okay, I know by hand, I've picked out these X number of references and I'm looking at these documents. Well, what happened is, and this happens all the time, particularly with large data sets, people miss areas. And in this case, the machine learning algorithms actually found a reference to another document within the footnote of a document. Well, that was important because the humans had actually missed that in the first round of going through this and saying, hey, this is a reference. So we do have to figure out, do I need that or not? And it's important to be able to identify that for people to see that that's something that's important. So I think those are the things that um, when you look at large volumes of documents, people are going to overlook that. And when you look at the error rates, when it goes into missing documents or finding documents, when you have a tool that can actually look through every single word and read through that entire document, it's always going to be that much more um, advanced from a perspective of identifying everything and wanting to weed it all out and figure out what's there. Catherine, any more insights into what your team did or how they looked at some of the documents? So um, I think it's really complete, uh, Keith. I think the important um, aspect for the team was really to access the information, go by iterations. And as we were progressing with the tech, deploying the tech and uh, going through the document, we were able to, um, to significantly improve the uh, performance of the algorithm. So as you say, as the algorithm will be run or the smart function will be run over the um, additional sets of data, it will become better and better. And this is the power of the tool we're proposing today. Since it's shared among uh, different parties, different customers, everyone can benefit from the uh, collaborative training of the model. Well, and I think what's really important as we look at uh, um, the addition of other AI-based techniques in this, Right now, we started out with just a company buying a compound and saying, I want to go through this compound and I want to find everything that's in here. So for the most part, all the documents that you're going to get in that compound um, listing of documents are going to be referred back to that same compound. What happens now if I buy a whole company? I'm going to get documents that are going to be in finance, legal, um, HR, also all over the place. We need to kind of separate those out and say, okay, where, where do they all go and how do they all kind of relate together? When I start to get into the compound documents, having the auto classification capability to look across those and be able to put them in the right place is so important for somebody that's actually looking at this because you may have regulatory people looking at what's happening with filings. You may have HR people looking at the CVs on people that are there as part of the process. You may have financial people looking at all the due diligence financial data. So there's all sorts of different things. Imagine if you've got a, a product that's over multiple countries and you need to break it out by country and be able to do that. And if there's multi-language capabilities in here, we want to be able to tackle all of those kind of things as we continue to improve the product and add more functionality based on the data sets that we're going to be pulling in. So our goal is to continue to um, identify different aspects of the um, M&A process and identify how people work at it. There are playbooks being developed right now for different companies that, that do this on a very regular basis that we want to incorporate some of that work into, into what we're doing. And Ref AI will become a piece of a much bigger whole as we're putting things together. With that in mind, let me talk a little bit about, you know, one of the concepts that we have, the concept of the landing zone with, with RegDocs, where we use a validated process to transfer all those documents from the selling company. We first want to get them and verify you've got the right documents. That's an important piece that we have to deal with. The second is once you have that landing zone and you have all those documents, we can now start the process of saying, what are we doing with those? That's where Ref AI comes in and it identifies all the missing documents that are there. We want to be able to find out what's there and we want to iteratively go through and request anything that's missing. So that whole first process is going to happen um, hopefully on a very a rapid basis. You only have a certain amount of time from a due diligence perspective to, to basically say yay or nay, we like what we've got or we don't like what we've got or, or we need to go back and get more information. 
if I've got something that could give me that information right out of the gate or, or help out in a much uh, more timely fashion, that's really important. So if you think about landing zone, iterating through those documents, requesting more documents, getting them all while you have that team in place um, at that time is huge. Once we do that, now we go through that whole classification capability. Think about as we're going through and we're reading through those documents, we're actually doing something else. We're identifying metadata, we're classifying, we're doing a bunch of things so that when we have that, we can actually use that information that we're creating along the way. And then we can create a transfer site that will actually put it in a format for the receiving company. What's really important about that is let's say you do multiple um, acquisitions and you're buying multiple companies or multiple compounds. If I can define how to put it into your legacy systems the first time, and we get a mapping algorithm that says, this is how you want it to be in there, we can actually create that so that it becomes a generic way of doing it every time you bring in a new set of documents. So our goal would then would be to say, we create an engine that ties all those documents together and puts them all into the right format for you to then suck into the, the legacy systems that are there or transfer them over or set up an interface. And in. we do a lot of work with interfacing with lots of different systems. So with, with APIs today and for the ways that we can um, look at, at putting stuff into legacy systems, we can transfer those documents directly into your legacy systems and save the time of, of you guys having to do that and, and doing that kind of work. What did this open up for us as we started to go through this process? We started to work with some very large partners in, in looking at how to use this tool. Excuse me one second. And one of the big things about that was we said, well, if I can use it for that, can I use it for this? And, and that was really interesting because now it said, well, if I've got this, let's say I'm doing a submission and I'm a, a submission company and I'm pulling in, you know, hundreds of documents to get ready for this submission that I'm going to do. Can I also cross-reference those to make sure that I'm not missing any documents? Absolutely. What if I have a marketing authorization for somebody else in another country that they're going to market my product for me over there? And we send a whole bunch of documents to them. Can we identify the documents that are, are, are going out or that they're missing? Or if you're doing a marketing authorization for somebody else, do you not want to wait until you you're, need them to go through them all? I think the concept of any large volumes of documents which refer to other documents can be a target for what we're trying to do. And I think it's important to note that this tool, right now we've only scratched the surface for some of the things that we think that it can be used for. Our goal really ultimately is to use it for lots of different things and to almost set up um, ways of using it and libraries that we're gonna use within this that even a company on a day-to-day -day basis when they're transferring large, large caches of documents can do that. One of the other things you can think about is instead of being the company that's receiving documents, one of the other things you might wanna think about is if I'm selling a compound, it works just the same way. We could actually take the documents you're looking to sell and we could actually run them through this same process to identify anything that you may be missing so that your people, before they even hand them off, can give them everything that they're expecting. Or in that same regard, you can actually go through the documents that you're sending out and you could define rules saying, hey, we don't want them to get these certain documents. So you could actually ad identify those up front to make sure certain things don't go out that shouldn't go out because ha that happens very often. We're working with clients where they'll get documents and all of a sudden they'll have a, a folder that they shouldn't have gotten. And it was somebody else's data or some data that, that was for a different product. So those are the kind of things you can actually search for and identify as part of that process. So there's a lot of really neat things that you can do with an AI perspective when you're dealing with large volumes of documents and you need to identify whether they're going or they're coming, and do you have everything you thought you had, or do you have more or less than you thought you had? With that being said, I know that Janae's deals with a lot of these same problems, and we actually throw a lot of problems toward Catherine's group, so they're actually working on other problems that are there. Catherine, tell us a little bit more about what you guys do and how you do it. 
Okay, so um, we've introduced a little earlier the um, different pieces of AI we could apply to one data set. So that's the principle of the marketplace. And Keith, interestingly, you just introduced um, the opposite principle. So starting with a piece of AI and then finding more matching data sets. So that's the concept that we're uh, leveraging behind the Genesis marketplace. So let me... <clears throat> start by identifying or explaining the different um, um, the different components of the marketplace. So on your left, you have the user. So the user is um, an organization um, that uh, has an instance, a private instance. The Genes instance can be on the, on the cloud, public, private, on-premise. Um, on your right, you have the providers of AI. Providers of AI could be Genize because we build uh, AI, but it could be other providers of AI who have developed a specific expertise, a very niche expertise to make data talk that is very relevant. And this expertise, we want to make it available to those who have assets in Red Docs, for instance. So everything is managed through the marketplace by the Genize um, uh, company infrastructure. So on your, on your right, the AI providers have the possibility to provide what we call smart functions, which are basically pieces of AI such as a ref AI. On your left, the user will browse and search smart functions um, with the help of our neural network search. Um, and then once they find the relevant smart function, either they found it through the search or they were uh, proposed by Geni the Genize machine learning intermediation algorithm, uh, some smart functions to, to make their data talk. So let's take again the mergers and acquisition uh, asset, um, the customer search for ref AI, finds ref AI, applies ref AI to the data set, but then Genes understands that based on a fit gap analysis, those quality management and classification algorithm could still be useful for the customers or prop propose them to the user who could acquire these two additional smart function. Once the smart function is selected by the user, they're executed. They always are executed on the private instance. So um, no data is taken elsewhere. And that's something that was really important when we started to, to, uh, to speak, uh, Keith and I, in, early on in our relationship, that we would respect the data, um, the, the location where the data was um, actually uh, stored. So nothing is taken uh, elsewhere. The algorithm are uh, run on the um, Genes instance that belongs to the customer. So um, once the algorithm, the smart function are uh, run, completion notifications are sent to the user and the AI provider, Genese uh, will invoice uh, based on a paper use um, uh, methodology, the um, smart function that was acquired or selected by the user, and will make sure to transit the money from the user to the actual AI uh, provider. So this is a, a, a nice way for the AI providers, whether they're big or small, to actually monetize their AI without having to go through a full implementation of a platform to actually support the specific smart function, but instead relying on the Genesis Marketplace as a one-stop shop for the users to consume any type of AI, whether it's provided by Genesis or by another uh, AI provider. Great, Catherine. That was awesome. Uh, I think one of the important things that Catherine brought to the to the table was the fact that the things stay in place. So for us, um, as a company dealing with, hang on a second, I seem to have skipped a little bit here. Um, for us as a company, we transfer that document, those documents, and we keep them in kind of a working place. We want to show control over that. That's a qualified and validated nature of of working in the life science world. So being able to have her tools working against our data sets and keeping that there and us being able to use that information to do something with that was really important. So that was a great way that Catherine and I were able to work together and our teams were able to work together to, to come up with some, some ultimate solutions.
Yes, and if a I could add more examples that we go ahead. If I could add something, um, so we talk often with our partners and customers about the importance of data privacy. So on both ends of the spectrum, uh, on the uh, user perspective and the AI provider perspective, everything is containerized. So no one, either the user or the AI provider, has access to either the raw data or the code itself. Everything is managed through containers, so everything remains private, both the intellectual property associated with the technology as well as the IP as so and the privacy associated with the raw data. So we made sure that we would build the infrastructure with these principles in mind. Great. Catherine, the last thing, talk a little bit more about your offerings. So additional offerings on the marketplace um, pertaining to quality management. So we were able to support customers in maintaining the drug establishment licenses. So again, it's um, exception detection. Um, we were able to reproduce the work of, uh, in this case, uh, two people, six months and seven minutes. So this was a this is a very interesting smart functions a smart function and then um, on the clinical um, trial aspect uh, of Genize we have another a really good example we were able to create an algorithm uh, machine learning um, that was able to actually detect uh, biomarkers so identify bio biomarkers and this example is really relevant uh, because um, it was applied to a long COVID study where we were able to actually find a path towards a cure. And this is under review by FDA in Santé Canada. So as you can see, we have a wide range of smart functions, AIs that can be applied specifically on um, data sets pertaining to life science or around, you know, R&D life science. And we're only growing our offer right now so we can offer the most um, the, the, the most diverse uh, offering of AI out there on the market within only one click in one platform. That's fantastic. Um, at this point now, thank you, Catherine, and, and hopefully we've given you a good enough explanation of what it is out there and what we're doing and how we're working together uh, between RegDocs and Ref AI to present a solution both for the M&A world and, and how you can purchase those compounds. Um, we had a question. One of the questions was, uh, have, have you ever worked with anybody doing a divestor? Uh, to this point, we have not, but there's nothing saying that we can't. I think it's actually something that we can definitely do uh, working with those companies. I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, one, of that, one of the issues about a divestor is making sure you're only giving them the stuff you want to give them. So putting those rules in place and identifying that, I think would be a great use case for what we could do with that. Uh, a next question here, and Catherine, I'm going to uh, see if anybody on your team might know this. When you mentioned containerized for LLM, can you share which LLM are you, you are using? Um, I would I think need... that's learning language module. Is that what yeah, that is? Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're using, we're basically using containers and Kubernetes to actually um, put the code that uh, correspond to smart functions within um, within um, specific, I would say, uh, specific containers. So it's basically a way to actually uh, uh, make sure that everything is uh, air gap and everything is protected on both the user end and the uh, AI provider's end. Great. Did that answer the question? We've got another question that just came in and said, what languages are supported? Currently French and English. We're working on Spanish and Italian. Great. We have some other tools within our repertoire with a court square that can do multi-language capabilities. So we could potentially kind of pull things together to, to actually work on a lot of languages with Catherine's group. So um, I wouldn't think that languages would be a barrier for what we're trying to do. Other questions? Well, I'm really excited about um, what we've brought to, to the market, how we're gonna get out there. Um, we, have, we have a number of these out in the, in the field today working, looking for many more companies that are trying to do this. We're trying to get to the uh, million size because I know I've got a couple of large pharma companies that are, are looking at us getting to that uh, very large size. So uh, the more companies we can work with, the faster we can get to the, uh, 
uh, the very large volumes, and that's uh, our next goal. So I'd love to talk with uh, anybody out there that's looking to try to do this type of work. Catherine, thank you very much. You I so appreciate much, you being on the, on the call. And uh, thanks, Roy. Did we have anything else that we wanted to follow up with? Uh, nope. I wanted to thank you both for a very uh, informative and interesting uh, conversation and demonstration of, of the application. And uh, we will be sending out an email. And this uh, video will be posted on Court Score's YouTube channel uh, within the next few days. That would be awesome. Thank you, everyone. Unless there's any other questions, uh, we'll give you some time back today. It's been awesome having this conversation with you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.